Can I now call upon uh, uh, Gert Jan uh, Nabours from Wageningen uh, University? He coordinated this European Forest Institute report that will uh, form the meat of our panel discussion to follow. So, um, for your questions and your comments on that panel discussion, I urge you to reflect deeply on what uh, Gert Jan has to say. Yes, thanks, uh, James. Um, well, there have been occasions where I did uh, presentations barefooted and even on a beach, and I would not mind uh, doing that now here in this sauna as well, but uh, I'll keep my shoes on. Um, let's see. Where it's. I will do it. Yeah, please, the next. So this is a, uh, I present to you a study that was uh, organized by European Forest Institute and funded by the Multi-Donor Trust Fund, and I certainly want to acknowledge all the co-authors who are here uh, here on the slide. It's really the group uh, effort that uh, that really made this happen. Uh, yes, please. Before looking to the future, I want to take you quite far back. And it was in the 1600s, uh, the, the 16th century, there were these early cartographers. And they tried to map Europe. And areas that they didn't know, they would draw dragons and monsters. And it was a, a very distant world for them. But still, there were very brave people if I can, that, uh, that sailed out there with the ships. And they tried to explore new lands. And they found new lands. And that is our task here in Paris as well in the coming two weeks, is to really find these new lands, but on our existing uh, land. We have to find these new opportunities and see where the possibilities are. And that is what we're going to do now as well for the forest sector, please. European forests cover roughly 40% of the European lands and they are a great resource. And already now the European forests have a sink of roughly 450 million tons of CO2. And that already compensates 10% of the EU fossil fuel emissions. Then in addition, these forests have a regular management in many regions and the harvested wood products uh, roughly continue now with a sink of roughly 44 million tons of CO2. And then in addition, biomass for bioenergy uh, produces 3% of the total EU energy need and also compensates for some use of fossil fuels. So all together, these forests have especially, and that's what the, the diagram points out, it's not only the carbon sink in the forest, but it's also the products and the energy. And it's this continuous management which is so characteristic for European forests already for centuries. And that is the, the, the prime, I think, prime asset also of European forests. And that's where the, the angle is, what we can, uh, where we, the level which we want to change if we want to strengthen this, uh, this role of European forests in the climate targets. Not only the forest ecosystem, but also products and energy. Yes, please. And I think this is one of the, the novel things of the study, is that we, we try to see the opportunities. Where can we strengthen this role of European forests? And in order to do that, um, we looked at how the different member states at the moment are functioning in the climate targets. And on the x-axis, you see the contribution of each national forest sector to the national GDP in millions of euros. And on the y-axis, you see how currently the forests are functioning in terms of a carbon sink. And you see a really nice sort of synergy where the member states along a certain line are functioning and the member states at the moment really find that synergy between and an active management and creating products and still maintaining a sink. And it's also, member states are certainly different and this difference is also an opportunity to strengthen this role of, of the, each forest uh, sector and forest ecosystem in the climate targets. You see that on the left side, my pointer is also gone, I think. Uh, do I? It is working. Well. Yeah, it is working. I'll uh, do it here. Much better. So on the left side, you see the former Eastern European countries. They tend to be more on the left side of the cloud of countries. Here you see the big importers of wood, Netherlands, UK, Italy, Germany. So they are really on the lower side of, of this, this cloud of how member states are functioning. And of course here the, the big bubbles means the, the, the countries with the big forest areas, Sweden, Finland, Spain, France, because they, they find a synergy between 
the wood products production and the carbon sink here on the on the y-axis and certainly they are different France is especially higher on the sink side so apparently it has a, a certain state of the forest resource that explains that and we'll come to that so earlier on forests were included in some way in the Kyoto Protocol but in a very limited way they were kept and their role was, was only that certain activities were included, um, certain, uh, and because of that, certain activities, only certain lands were included, finally, in the accounting under the Kyoto Protocol. Now, why was this kept so much? It be was believed that the, the forest sink was very uncertain. The permanence might be under risk from fire and storm. It was also perceived that not much could be achieved. It would be very difficult to achieve anything in the land use sector. And the sinks are already there. Just taking up sinks in the target would simply decrease actually your, your overall target. That was very often the reasoning there. And this is what we, uh, we assessed in the study, also very much based on, uh, on earlier studies by David Allison, who is here in, in, the, in the audience. The black bars are the fossil fuel emissions from the total EU. Um, below x-axis is the current forest sink you see it a little bit saturating but you also see in these little bars here that is the, the degree to which countries are allowed to take up the, the carbon sink very small target and that is the reasoning that we say if the, if the role of forest and what you can take up is so small then there is no incentive to change anything in your forest management if we calculate with this sink then actually the net emissions of the EU are this orange line. This is the commitment to target and this is the new minus 40 target from the climate and energy package. What we calculate is that if you take up forests and you incentivize them in the different ways what I outlined, then you can really strengthen that and then you could even reach a minus 50%. So then this role of forest, which is roughly currently 12-13% of the EU em emissions, you can strengthen that up to 20%. And it's the variety that's really characteristic of European forests. And it's within this variety that you have to find the opportunities. You see a map here of harvest intensity. The orange, yellow orange is where you are roughly harvesting 100% of your increment. And you can see that the harvesting pressure is mostly here. Central, Eastern Europe, Southern Scandinavia. But there are also very blue and green areas where the harvesting is 50% of the increment or even less. So it's different opportunities. And if I was an NGO, then I would say, well, there's apparently we can set up a lot of strict reserves in Europe. Apparently there's no need for more wood. If I was an industry, I would say, well, I can maybe harvest more here for new products for the bioeconomy and in the end also bioenergy. So it's this difference of opportunities that we then further explain. So and that's our reasoning, that each sector has to take its role, otherwise we will never reach a minus 40% uh, target. And gradually, what you see, developing countries are also phasing in the land use sector. The red plus discussion is very much at stake here in the negotiations. So if developing countries are able to do that, then we feel that the EU should also be able to do that. We have a rather stable sink. We have a managed forest resource which we can manage. And that is the, the entrance what we uh, see as a, as, a, as a very good starting point to strengthen the sink of uh, forest further. Yes. So what we propose is to further uh, enhance this role of EU forest um, up with another 9%. So I started with 12, 13% of the current role, up with another 9%, 8, 9%. And then we think a full inclusion of forest and forest sector seems feasible to get away from this Kyoto Protocol with small areas that are included, not included, small caps that do not lead to incentives. If we take up the full land use, that would give a incentives uh, to strengthen the, the sink and, and the activity in the sector. We first of all think that the EU should set that overall target and given the sector and, and that it's not a very rapidly changing sector that also needs to be taken into account, the timetable for setting these targets might be longer than, uh, than the 2030 target. And then once the EU has decided that then the different member states, given the different circumstances, 
they can uh, decide how to share that target and where they see their own opportunities. And the targets must be larger than the current caps in order to create that incentive. Um, what we then say is that member states, um, they should update and create policies that create actually an incentives in a sort of a climate smart forestry way. And this climate smart forestry really looks at the, at the local circumstances. For example, if you have a, a storm prone area, central Germany has really high stocking uh, and storm prone areas, well maybe you can think of bringing down those stocks and with those wood products try to invest in, in new bioeconomy products. And at the same time regenerate the forest maybe in a climate adapted way and re uh, make sure that you have a regrowing forest resource. For example, another opportunity, drained peat areas. Large areas of Scandinavia forestry is on drained peats. You may really need to think if you want to continue that. You're losing carbon from the drainage of peat, you're gaining some from the wood products, but those are areas where you may think, do you really want to continue that? Um, remote areas, difficult, difficult uh, to access areas, uh, areas where the economic uh, um, the economic gain for the forest owners is very limited. There you may, may really think, do I really want to continue forest management or do I establish strict reserves there? Especially to enhance biodiversity and to maintain the carbon stock in there. France, for example, where we are here, has large areas of outgrown coppice. Not much is happening in that. And a lot of that is used in non-commercial fuel wood, at burning at very low efficiency, not creating any jobs, not creating any uh, climate gains, uh, product gains. So these outgrown coppice areas, that's where you can start to think of, do I regenerate that in another way? And do I create another type of forestry there? So in this variety is what we especially uh, uh, emphasize. Thank you. And uh, so, I conclude, there are no dragons in this area, only opportunities. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Gert Jan. Do we have some questions? Okay. Gentleman here, yes. Loic Lopez, um, free thinker, uh, not associated with anything except this planet. Um, I really wanted to talk about biodiversity. I know it's, it may not be the, the topic, um, but sometimes we see climate change as being the most important thing, and sometimes they may clash. And forestry, perhaps, in, in people's perception, might be one of those places. Mm -hmm. So if you could just speak a bit more about those opportunities and to see whether, are they dragons? Maybe they are dragons. Yeah. Yes, um, the relation with biodiversity is certainly there and I touched upon it very briefly in this climate smart forestry and that you have to really s locally specific, really design your measures in, in such a way that you try to find win-win combinations. And in some cases it is indeed best to establish reserves and to maintain the carbon stock and also increase biodiversity. Um, in other regions, I think forest owners are able to find the, the balance between and producing wood products, managing the forest and maintaining a certain level of biodiversity. And up to a certain level of intensity, these things can really go together. If you go into very intense forestry, yes, no, no doubt you lose a lot of biodiversity. But it's, it's finding that middle range where you can and maintain your forest management, a continuous flow of products and still maintain biodiversity, that's where the, the really the win-win options are. Well, I have a question, Jan. The, I, I thought that um, I, was, I was listening to a kind of litany of win-win situations from you until I heard you say, well, developing countries are going to have red, so we think we should be allowed to have this. And then I thought, uh, hang on, that's intensely political. So could, could I ask you to, to underline a point that the report makes quite crisply about whether we're talking about an increment to existing mitigation obligations or a way of trading off some of those obligations into the forest? No, I, w I would say that the, the, the group was, was pretty clear that we would not like to trade that what you can gain in the forest that, that you would not have to achieve in your fossil fuel reduction. No, this would really be incremental. And uh, with one of, the, one of the slides that I showed, where you, if you do take up the forest and you do stimulate 
the, the sink in there, this climate target of minus 40%, you could even try to reach minus 50%. So it would really have to be incremental. Yes. That would be your recommendation, but of yes. course it may not be what politicians yeah. hear or read. Yeah. Yeah. Peter Wehrheim from the European Commission. Maybe I come in too early into that debate, um, but um, Gerd Jan, I think uh, what, what you have presented is provocative, um, and I can't resist uh, um, to comment on it, because you have thrown a very big um, figure into the room, um, the 10% um, um, that could come um, of, uh, um, from forests, European forests, uh, in, in terms of uh, emission reductions uh, compared to other carbon um, emissions. Um, why, why are you um, presenting it like that? And why are you not looking at uh, what we currently have in the international climate regime? Um, we, we do have, uh, indeed, uh, the Kyoto uh, rules, mm. which have been negotiated uh, in this context some years ago. Um, and uh, if they um, apply, um, well, my, my um, argument would be these numbers would be much lower. Can you give us an estimate of how much lower they would be? Um, well, the way these caps currently work is that it's, it's a very small part of what is actually the sink in the forest ecosystem. And, uh, well, countries can take up, a ver uh, well, it, it's really minimal what countries are now allowed to take up in, in, in their targets from the forest sector. And that, we feel, does not give an incentive to, to try to improve anything to try to make this into an, an, an active sector and also a sector maybe that preserves biodiversity very well and a sector that also creates a bioeconomy. There are no incentives now to do anything. And that's what we feel. If, if you don't cap it and you, you take up the full forest uh, land and then put an additional target on that, that would also urge countries to, to try and make use of this, uh, this type of land use. Can I, Peter, can I ask yeah. you to just spell out your scepticism um, yeah. a, a little bit more? Is your scepticism about the potential uh, that uh, Get Jan is describing, or do you think it's wishful to, to speak of that potential when it's not currently harnessed by a, a, a policy regime? Well, my scepticism um, um, refers to the fact that uh, um, the rules which have been um, agreed under Kyoto, um, they, they want to uh, make sure that uh, um, only for additional um, action also um, credit is given. Um, and uh, um, therefore, these accounting rules um, are there. Um, and from my point of view, um, we have enshrined them also into EU legislation and they do give incentives um, um, to keep our forests in view of climate mitigation in Europe uh, in good shape, um, and they are helping us to do so. So you think if, if this potential is, is there, why hasn't it already been realized? That's what you're saying. No, um, the, the rules which we currently have, um, they, they work in as far as uh, forests are um, a sink in Europe, um, and uh, um, therefore they help to incentivize that our uh, the carbon sink in European forests is protected and preserved. Okay, well perhaps we, we can yeah. continue this into our panel discussion. It's a good start. Yes, gentlemen there. In the middle of the room, yeah. Thank you very much, Gerdi, and my name is Heike Granholm. I come from the Finland and, and one of the negotiators. Just to, to get it clear, uh, what you are saying that if it's properly incentivized, then the EU could uh, double the contribution of forests in 15 years. How do you do it? I mean, that's my question. It, 15 years is so short time. How can we do it to double the contribution of forests? Now it's 10% in the EU level. You say it would be double in, in 15 years. Uh, what does it mean in practice? Does it mean that we would stop? Harvesting, or what is the practical tool to do it? Please. 
No, that's you're, you're right. We we do take up this statement that this 2030 target is really very nearby. It's too nearby for the forest sector to really respond and really make its its contribution. I think you should always see this forest and forest sector as as part of the of a, of a longer term scheme. And I think that this uh, this estimate what we bring this uh, going from the current 12 13 percent contribution if you calculate wood products and bioenergy as well up to this 20 percent so it's it's an extra seven eight percent that that would indeed take longer and then you have to think towards 2040 2050. Okay, I, I don't. I don't think uh, in the report uh, you limit yourself to, to 15 years at all. Yeah. You? No. No. Yes. Um, I probably shouldn't be speaking now because I'm speaking in the panel just later on, so you'll probably hear enough of my voice. Um, but just to weigh in on this discussion um, about the targets and you know whether the reason why there are such strict rules which make the contribution look smaller is because we didn't want in Kyoto forests to take away ambition from reducing emissions in other industrial sectors. Now, if the position of this report is that forests must not harm the mitigation in other sectors, then of course you, you can take away those complicated rules and you can have a whole completely different regime. And I know that there is, of course, a great interest in wanting to find numbers and I, we're a campaigning organization, I work at FERN, we're also always trying to find specific numbers because that's what people hang on to, but I wouldn't get fixated on this 9% or the 13% or the 22% I saw on Twitter from James yesterday. I mean, these are, these are I indicators of, of how important this sector is, but I think we shouldn't get hung up on, uh, on the specific um, tons of CO2 because in any case, we know that there's a great degree of uncertainty when we measure carbon in forests, so this is an indication that it's, that it's important and I'm glad that this report gives that indication, but uh, it's it, it's a number. It could have been yeah. ten. It could have been seven. Yeah. I'd, I'd let the, the, these big numbers breathe a little longer before you get distinguished. <laughs> Do we have another question? Yes. So, if I understand, you're from Finland. This no, no, I'm Dutch. Norwegians anywhere? Um, my question is: There's a huge Norwegian forest sector. Do you um, have any solutions how the Norwegian market could, the forest market could target how that could work, some mechanisms? It's not part of the EU, so that's why my question is, uh, it would have to be a uh, national policy. How would that kind of, uh, since it's outside the EU legislation? Yes, indeed, in, in the graphs, uh, Norway was not included. Um, the Norwegian forest sector is it's it's totally different you should not that's it's totally different from Sweden and Finland it's uh, it has a very small forest sector as as such um, also a rather fragmented forest ownership and i think that's maybe where norway can also find its its uh, incentives then and its measures is to certainly in, in the southern part of norway the growth rates are a bit higher maybe there, that's where you could try to develop a, a bioeconomy um, stimulate forest owner, forest ownership co collaboration, and and probably further up north where the growth rates are very small. Um, well, you you probably have to think more of uh, strict reserves there. Is, does that answer uh, it? You said collaboration because it's fragmented ownership. Hmm. Um, can you say a little bit more how um, your prescription in the report, um, are you thinking more of a platform where people who are owners of forest collaborate, but what is the incentive for the credits? Um, Can you uh, put a few slides back? There was a map, uh, the, yeah, the uh, one, uh, forward, that one, yes. This is a, a map with a small part of uh, Atlantic part of Europe. Uh, and every single color, if you can see that, yeah, every single color is a forest owner. Um, the average size of a forest holding in Europe is 2.7 hectares. And that is the, the, the basis with which you work from the, the private owners. And even if this average size is very small, there are still larger owners in a, in a region, which you also see here in different colors. 
this, this light green is an owner with maybe 700 hectares and then the blue one is a thousand hectares and then there are very small scatters of, of, uh, of owners. Um, I think it's if you want to incentivize something you, you would for example, a country could think of a, of a uh, replanting uh, subsidy, trying to regenerate forests that are not growing well, that are not producing the products that you want, trying to have an, a subsidy. But you could maybe set a constraint that only owners over 50 hectares can apply for that. Maybe that stimulates owners to, to en enlarge their ownership structure if legally that's possible at all, but, but that sort of setting constraints and, and targeting measures to certain types of owners. Can you say more about the specific credit itself, the design of that product, what do you see? Features? What it has, what it doesn't have? Well, there are uh, public spending on, on forestry in Europe is, is not huge. Um, I think on average, uh, countries spend like four euro per hectare per year on their forests. So that, that in itself is already a total difference compared to what's happening in agriculture. And of course food is important, that certainly also is, we, we need to remember that. But you can also think of in, in for example rural development policies, can I design some measures to sim stimulate collaboration between forest owners? Uh, training, a lot of forest owners hardly even know well, maybe they don't even know where the forest is, but very often they don't even know what tree species are there, how much wood is there. Um, so even those very basic trainings, capacity building, that already can achieve a lot in terms of management of the forest. You see this as a, a government initiative or a local government initiative or in private? How do you see this collaboration? Like who is the owner of saying, I am providing you training and who is the, what do you see? Sometimes uh, 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 there are uh, government uh, executive agencies that sometimes have the, the task to do that. Sometimes there are private consultancies that can do these sort of support actions. There are national associations of forest owners who can maybe try to stimulate that sort of measures. There are lots of uh, ways to do that. Okay. Um, uh, I'm going to cut... Um this, this off now, but uh, uh, get Jan is very kindly going to sit on our panel discussion, so there will be further opportunity to interrogate him there. <laughs> Good, Jan, thank you very much indeed.